Productions Films Coordinator, and I'm here today with some of the folks behind Bleeding Ham Film Festival, so I'm going to let them go ahead and introduce themselves. Um, Gary, do you want to start? Hi, I'm Gary, and I think I'm at the wrong place. I thought this was uh, something else, so I'm going to leave now. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, my name is Gary, and I'm one of the founders of the Bleeding Ham Film Festival, and also a local filmmaker slash videographer. Uh, and we, I, we've been running the festival for this is our 10th year now. Yep, this is going to be yeah. number 10. So yeah, that's, uh, yeah, and, and yeah, yeah, that, oh, yeah, I'm a Bellingham local. Sweet. I'm Langley West. I'm one of the co-founders of Bleedingham and its host, and uh, I'm an artist, sometimes effects artist, less today than used to be, um, and uh, I am I am a, a I am a, a, a Bellinghamster, but I'm one that moved here, and I have to say that I have never found a more welcoming place in my life. Here is where I live. Here is where I'll die. Uh, hi, I'm Connor. Um, I'm a local filmmaker, uh, and. I wasn't there for the start of Bleeding Ham, but I think I've had four or five movies in the festival. Awesome. All right, Casey. <laughs> hey everybody, I'm Casey Schmidt, and I am also one of the co-founders of Bleeding Ham. Um, I am the owner of Northwest Grip. I play with lights and sometimes cameras. So I guess I wanted to start off just hearing from Langley and Gary. Y'all are the founders. So could you just tell me a little bit more about how Bleedingham originally got started? And like, what was your inspiration for it? Gary, do you agree with me that there are like three different origin stories for Bleedingham? No, no there's <laughs> only one. The other stories are lies. It all started at a... Uh, uh, okay, so I'm a big purveyor of the Pickford Film Center. A big, not purveyor, but an advocate for the Pickford Film Center. Mm -hmm. uh, I've always, I've always enjoyed their programming and the events that they provide for the film community. In particular, there was a show. There was like some sort of uh, film festival that a friend of mine actually threw, and he's a great guy. But he had these. Uh, me and Langley went to go check it out, and I was still in college up at Western at the time, probably like in my last quarter or something. And when we say founders, I want to say that uh, that guy in the in the the, the folk music uh, band stage over there, he's a founder too. He's just he wasn't at Western. I mean, he wasn't like he was there the whole time. It's just like me and Langley always get called that, but it was it was him too, and a, a young lady named Abiel. Um, but the way it all started was so we go to this 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 film festival, which was like a celebration of like hip hop culture. And they had these live performers come and the, the performers were somewhat outlandish. And one of them started humping my leg and like literally just came to the, I'm sitting in a chair and this, this performer comes up and he's like, and I'm like, get off me, man, get off me. And so we go to this, this bar called the Grand around the corner, right? Afterwards. And we, you know, we we're drinking and I was like, man, oh, that was just terrible, man. They disrespected the man. There was, there was people were rude. And, you know, I was like, God, what a terrible day. I was like, man, if we had a film festival, it would be totally respectful of the Pickford. And then, you know, me and Langley both like horror. So we're like, it'd be about horror. And then some one of us called out drunk. It would be called Bleeding Ham. And this guy, Con Buckley, was like, that actually sounds great. So I had, I had also met Casey around the time. And me and Langley put it on our brains that we wanted to do this. And I had met Casey through a mutual friend that I was, that was interning with me. And so we decided to uh, kind of see how we jive together. And back in the day, there was a, a film challenge called Trailer Wars started by Chris Patton and Sean Meyer. It was very popular. And uh, you know, the theme was like 90 scary movies. So we made a, uh, a fictitious spin on the ring, which were, I mean, I was proud of the Langley's effects, but the content, you know, we were, we were younger. So it's called the swing hold instead on. of the ring. Hold on, hold on. Dude, the swing was great. 
I don't like from from top to bottom. It was great. It's, Casey, do you feel like the swing is great? Oh, great. I, I, is it still I, great? Occasionally, man, I'll go through the old YouTubes and I'll watch all of those videos of that era. And I'm so pleasantly surprised every single time. <laughs> oh, the swing, the swing is where you had the uh, the right, the big yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. we we made a like a, a two foot silicone penis. Okay. And, uh, yeah. Is this appropriate? This isn't appropriate. We should talk about this. I mean, it was funny at the time, but now it's explaining it ten years later, it sounds like. <laughs> well, like total... this is for college students. Everybody okay, so, so basically, instead of the ring. <laughs> You know, how, like in the ring, when you watch the videotape, somebody comes out the screen to get you. Mm -hmm. Well, in the swing, if you went to this certain porno website, somebody came out with a giant dildo to kill you. <laughs> and, uh, and, the, and the character that had watched the, the, the website is a local comedian named DK Reinemer. He actually wrote that. And we, we were like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. You know, and we want to play on the ring. And, uh, and then so we Langley VFX a giant dildo going through his chest. It, uh, like, it like awesome. aliens, it was, it was, it's still pretty brutal. It's, you know, it was, it was pretty good, but, but, you know, after that we started formulating and we, we, we met with the Pickford and, um, and the first time around, I'll never forget me and Casey must have ran around and Langley too, shooting everybody's film in town with them. Like anybody who wanted to make a film, we were like, all right, we got your back. And like, we went and we made those films and then, uh, I think we ended up with what, like 14, 15 films the first time? Oh, for, for the very first, uh, uh, yeah. yep, yep. So we ended up with like 14 or 15 films, all super hyper local. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's basically how it started. There wasn't anything really, there wasn't a lot of deep thought behind it. It was just one night where we thought we could do better than some other people. We, we, we knew that we wanted a, a, a festival for people specifically doing horror. However, we didn't really know how to do that. Like we, we helped everybody with their content and stuff. And we kind of, we were just kind of winging it as far as the festival went. And, and looking back at the very first one and the, actually, you know, to say the first couple, um, it shows, but we, over time, like every year, we just kept going and going and building and building. And the important thing, for me is that the people entering the festival the filmmakers part of the whole idea they got better and better and better and better and we as organizers got better and began offering um better things uh for the filmmakers Well, Connor, you have been participating in Bleeding Ham as a filmmaker for a long time now. Do you feel like you've seen <laughs> yeah. your films have been improving year after year? Yeah. Uh, just well, I had never made a horror movie before I entered into Bleeding Ham. And to be honest, the first time I got in, I really didn't want the person to enter it into Bleeding Ham. <laughs> uh because i think our movie was the very last one to get selected um but throughout the years definitely got a lot better and the last two years have had like uh some award-winning films so that's been cool and obviously getting to know gary moore and casey and doing stuff with them outside the horror spectrum as well and just getting to know them and you know uh what they're like as people as well as filmmakers, but, and then Langley, you know, I, I always see him as the host of Bleeding Ham and I know he makes the really dope posters and everything, so, but yeah, no, uh, I know everyone uh, who's part of that crew, but um, yeah, I wasn't there for the very beginning, so I can really speak to that. Mm -hmm. By the way, well, what by the way, Connor, I haven't seen you in a long time. Hi. Yeah, hey, how you doing? <laughs> Good. So what made you all decide that you wanted it to be a horror festival? What is it about horror that that you were really drawn to specifically? Gary, you want to take the first part of that? That's easy. I'm a vampire. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, 
so as a kid growing up in a, in a poor African-American family in the South and then with a small immigrant family up North, I'm black and Filipino. One of the things that went across both cultures was kind of like a Saturday night movie night kind of thing. And I just happened to, uh, I just happened to watch a lot of scary movies in the eighties with my family. And then I would start sneaking awake to stay up and watch the even scarier films, you know, and, uh, and I'm not one of those type of people that are like, I identify with the monsters because they're so dark and evil and monster. No, I, I have a good time bonding with people over a shared experience of, uh, you know, fear that doesn't have any kind of actual cost, you know what I mean? So uh, I've always liked horror movies and, and, and stuff and scary stuff like that. And I've always liked rooting for the person to escape and and trying to figure out kind of, you know, like in the old Scream movies, how this guy was like, these are the rules if you want to survive a horror movie. Well, one of the rules I learned first was uh, if you're black, you're in a lot of trouble because they kill black people in the beginning of all the horror movies. But that's starting to change. That's starting to change. Thanks to filmmakers like Connor and Jordan Peele. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just Jordan Peele, not you, Connor. <laughs> that's okay. I can't take credit for that. Yeah, but you understand what I'm saying. So like, as, uh, as I went to school for videography and stuff, I went to Fairhaven and I love social justice and I love environmentalism and I love documentary style film. However, I there was kind of just this like, well, what do you do when you want to make a movie just to be scary? You know what I mean? And Langley uh, had a lot of good ideas and Casey had a lot of know-how and, um, and also good ideas. I think me and Casey's angle into comedy, and I mean, Casey, correct me if I'm speaking for you, but we kind of like the horror comedy kind of vein. Mm -hmm. You know, so like, well, sometimes we go to Crypticon and not everybody has a good time. I have a good time. I have a pumpkin head shirt, but you know, <laughs> uh, it's, it's all about the movies, I guess I'd have to say, you know? Um, for me, growing up a poor white child in the South, um, we also had the the Saturday ritual of sitting in front of creature features. Um, uh, probably about ten years earlier than than what Gary was doing, I'm guessing. So mid seventies, early seventies, mid seventies, um, and it was huge. It was, I mean, and I am one of the people who the Frankenstein monster, um, Dracula, Wolfman all the universal monsters were my friends. Are you rooting for the xenomorph too, man? I'm sorry? <laughs> Are you rooting for the xenomorph too? Yeah, but the xenomorph came to me as a teenager. So we're we're more like, you know, I, the Jets and the Sharks, right? Like, <laughs> my, that's my rival gang, right? I'm like, I want to fight the xenomorph, but... <laughs> monster i want him to like you know hug me and shit you know um but yeah more than any other genre uh horror gave me um a sense of purpose uh a sense of friendship um and a, a uh, for lack of a better word a way to deal with the world um but, and, and not only that horror is inherently at least to people like us fun and you know there was already a thriving film scene in Bellingham whenever uh whenever I first moved here that it had been here a while um but a lot of it was I and I've talked about this before a lot of it was um social justice based and 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 about quote-unquote important things right um there wasn't a lot of places aside from trailer wars for people to let their hair down and just have fun, get better at their skills, but do it with something fun. Um, and that for me, that was a big reason why um, horror was important for the festival. I, mean, I, I could chime in on that. Um, yeah. I, I like that you went to the fun aspect. I mean, I, I know you guys know for me, that's always been the key factor in the horror. It's like, you know, I, I can go to the conventions and I look around, I'm like, ah, the, the horror culture yeah. thing. Uh, it's not so much my thing, <laughs> but, but, you know, when it comes to, especially when you're talking about indie filmmakers, people don't have a lot of resources. You know, when you're making uh, a short film for no money, you know, life dollars, hugs and bagels, 
Uh, it, you know, if you're on a budget, you get a little cream cheese on that bagel. It's like, you want to have a good time, you know, and you know, you don't have resources with tons of gear and, you know, professional actors that most of the time. So, you know, okay, well, what can I do? You start looking around and making account of the things you have access to. It's like, well, uh, I, I have a shitty garage. Uh, I have, uh, you know, a kitchen full of knives, you know, it's like, <laughs> a guy uh, who can put some blood together, you know, and it's like, I have friends that are willing to uh, get super dirty and scream on camera. It's like, all right, that's, that's the recipe for making some shit, you know? And so that was the thing. And, and I still feel that like, you know, anybody that has the ambition can come together, you know, get a crew, get a couple cameras, make a fun idea and just do something awesome. And, and horror is such a great vessel for that. Um, and, and that's the part of it that's always attracted me. Yeah, I agree. I've always thought that horror is like the ultimate low budget genre because it's almost better when it's low budget than when it's really high budget Hollywood horror. <laughs> it, like it just lends itself so well. It's true. And then, so, I agree yeah, with that. I mean, there's been so many like super successful horror movies that were made on really low budgets like pretty much all of the most classic iconic horror movies were low budget indie movies yeah no that's great yeah. but i mean but, yeah, but, this, but on the flip side of that horror is actually kind of getting kind of somewhat sophisticated too a lot of a24 <laughs> horror is actually pretty pretty well done you know what i mean and uh it's crossing over into mainstream making making uh waves and, and getting impressions in places where horror wouldn't usually get those kind of impressions, you know? So. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. think that a horror film won the Academy Award for Best Motion Picture a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. yeah. Parasite? Parasite. Shape of Water. <laughs> that horror movie? I thought that was like a fantasy love story merman thing. And oh, that uh, wait, hold on. Fantasy love story mermaid man thing does not equal horror to you. No, that's <laughs> that equals sexy, man. <laughs> that's fair. Fast Bender was a monster in that movie, man. That was wild. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 I guess the real monster in that was uh was it Fast Bender or was it Michael O'Shannon? Was it Mike Shannon or whatever? What's the guy's name? Yeah. He's such a good douchebag. It's crazy. Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> Mike Shannon is so many messed up roles man <laughs> no. yeah i think the perception of horror in like mainstream audiences has definitely changed a lot just over like even the last couple of years definitely a24 has had a lot to do with that mm -hmm. yeah i'm actually really excited about a lot of their offerings uh hereditary was was like groundbreaking but like it was a return to like that Rosemary's Baby kind of feeling, you know what I mean? For me, at least, you know, so mm -hmm. uh, I think Tony it's, Collette killed it. It's intellectual horror it's, and it's creepy and it's in, in, invasive. It, it, it stays with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, Midsummer was kind of like that. It, it just didn't have the supernatural element that I'm always looking for. But, uh, but I mean, it was also pretty well, uh, pretty well uh, executed and thought out. Oh yeah, dude! Midsummer was so uniquely done. The fact that they made that terrifying, and you know, you watch it in the beginning, you're getting into it, you're like, where is this going? And then the second that dude just walks off that cliff, and you see the guy with the hammer he's been holding the whole time, you're thinking like, I know this is coming down on somebody just in that moment. <laughs> like, Holy shit! Man. Yeah, but after that scene, I'm still like, yo, this furniture is like IKEA Prime, homie. You know, like, <laughs> like their, their furniture game was just. You know. <laughs> what about you, Connor? You don't you don't even really like horror, do you? Uh, I mean, I really didn't get super into it until I started making stuff with all you guys, um, and just for the festival. I mean, my favorite one is like uh, just like Army of Darkness, some like Bruce Campbell type stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, it definitely in the horror or you know horror comedy vein because. I've just always made sketch comedy type stuff. So kind of transfers to that. But speaking on like current horror, I guess it's just more of like, like the monster thing, you know, obviously can still work and it's been done a lot, but now it's more about like what you can't see. And it's interesting how like social issues are creeping into that, you know, obviously Jordan Peele get out is like a great example, but um, yeah, it's more of like a fear of just like, 
real life things, but um, you can do it safely in your own home <laughs> and then and just kind of think note. about it later. Did you see Antebellum? No, I haven't seen that one yet. Uh, you got to You got to see that. It's better. Than All, right. All right. Hey, cool. I, that brings up a point. Horror has always been a mirror for the concerns of society. And I don't know, I mean, you, you could probably say that about all kinds of genres, but in particular, whenever I think of horror, if you think back to the, um, the horror films of the early 70s, uh, environmentalism was like the big thing, right? We had a gas shortage, um, you know, we were losing bald eagles because of DDT, et cetera, et cetera. There was, and, and this was all big stuff, it was in the news. And what did we have? We had, Lana. yeah. We had piranha, we had jaws, we had, well, earlier we had the birds. Um, but yeah, we had all these nature is coming to eat you. Yeah. <laughs> now, there was one like a mutated bear that was really popular. I forgot which one that was. Dude, yeah, yeah. bam, it's just giant skinned mutated bears. Like, and, and, and it's directly in response to, um, uh, a lumber mill uh, poisoning the waters. It, it, anyway, um, the, the point that I'm making is that horror always kind of uh, reflects what's going on in society. Yeah, like the way George Romero famously did so in uh, Night of the Living Dead when the brother got killed at the end. Yeah, absolutely. That was that was big. It was during the civil rights movement, and it and it, it sent it sent a pretty loud message out there. You know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was huge, and I don't think. I don't think enough people, I, I, we, we, we realize it now, but I don't think enough people figured it out at the time, you know? Yeah. So. Sorry, Robin, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no, that, that's perfect. Y'all are doing my job for me. <laughs> um, I was going to ask if you feel like um, the festival has also kind of evolved along the years as you've also seen like trends in horror in general evolve. Is that usually reflected in the festival every year? Yeah, yeah, it is. Like um, last year, there was an insane amount of high production stuff that came out for being in the middle of a quarantine or not a quarantine, but you know, like with the pandemic lockdowns and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I understand that some of that was made before everybody went into lockdown, but I was just, that was one of the trends last year. I was like, damn, these are some really high, you know, we were kind of expecting like people shooting stuff around their house, like first year, second year bleeding him stuff. And we saw stuff that definitely took crews and it was like, wow, how are people getting this done? You know, and I mean, every year, we I hate to say this, but like, when I first started Bleeding Ham, I was like, yeah, I can make films with the best of them. But every year, I feel like I'm getting further and further away from the talent that is emerging. Like as far as my being my own, like I'm like my, my stuff is simple and dumb compared to that, right? And that's the way I look at it because there's just all these new minds coming out that are taking advantage of the technology, that are taking advantage of the, the mistakes of filmmakers of the past and just and, and learning from those and really making really tight, like for instance, uh, and I'm not trying to uh, rub rub your forehead and tell you you're a good cat, but uh, Connor's film last was a, like a big step up in production quality and like storytelling, and and and, and he like successfully integrated the, the the issue of wearing a mask, you know, uh, as a part of horror. And like, I think when when me and Casey were making horror, we we're just like, yeah, we'll shoot somebody in the head and then stab them in the chest, and then a monster comes out of a closet and kills everybody, and then all of a sudden this giant dildo stabs somebody, through. you know, and like, so and it's just amazing. And every once in a while, I'll say every three years, we get what I like to call a stabbing ham, which is like a bleeding ham full of knife kills. <laughs> and, you know, so it's like, it's like, oh, it's stabbing ham, okay, you know, and there's still great films and stuff, but. You know, apparently knives are pop more popular than uh, some years than others. Uh, so <laughs> I've seen that trend. Go ahead. I have I have a theory about that. So when you're first learning how to do practical effects, one of the things that you learn right off the bat and that you can pull off convincingly is gore. 
is stabbing with a knife and stuff like that. And so when you get a new, a, a, a new crop of, um, uh, you know, budding special effects people, they want to do that. You're going to, you're always going to get zombies. You're always going to get slashers. Those, those are always going to be mainstays. And, and that's okay. The trick is, can you tell a new or unique story with those elements? You know, that's, that's the thing. Um, but in, in answer to your question, Gary's right. Like the trends, as far as Bleedingham goes, has more to do with the quality of the filmmaking than of the, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, relevance of the filmmaking. Um, although we have seen, um, since we first started, themes that are um, uh, diversity, feminism, all these things that we talk about today, we have started seeing those things come up in Bleedingham films. Whereas when we first started with Bleedingham, it was just about the monster in the closet. It was just about the stabbing. It was just about the zombie or whatever trying to eat you. And now we're seeing, actually for the last few years, we, we're, we're seeing a lot more nuanced and um, uh, storytelling that correlates to social issues that are happening around those times. Absolutely. And, yeah. and honestly, we created, we created a space for that. And that's what, and that's, so we're really happy to watch that actually blossom, you know, like yeah. it's super fun. Like I think Casey's like, he, he spoke to something super important about indie film. If you're getting paid a bagel and cream cheese, you're going <laughs> to want to have fun. Most of the time with these horror movies, unless you're Connor and you have awesome scruples, the greatest <laughs> guy ever, nobody's getting, I mean, you know, at our level, a lot of people aren't getting paid. Maybe the actors are getting paid, but a lot of people are sacrificing their time. And, you know, the fun element has always been a big part of it. And there's still the fun element, but over the past four or five years, there's been more purpose, I guess, you know, like, okay, we've, we've created a space for, for filmmakers. And then when we went for international, our biggest goal is trying to get local filmmakers to pay attention to what other filmmakers across the world are doing instead of this giant circle of people patting themselves on the back. We're from the Northwest, you know, and it's like, man, just look a little bit outside your state. There's a story being told that you just missed your eye on because you're too busy looking at your man right down the corner or your homegirl that's making a film over here. And it's like, the world, international stuff is, is just like amazing. Different experiences, different culture to bring forth a different story to be told. And that's really refreshing when you're looking at like 90 films, 130 films a year for submissions. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, definitely the international films, uh, like every single one of them is just amazing. And it's like, I don't know if any of the Washington people typically can compete with it but like it's good to kind of have both because first you just have to like successfully make a movie and then once you make a few and you start honing your craft then you can start introducing you know all these ideas um and social issues and all of that um but yeah it's cool to like have those competitions every year where you're like okay, I'm going to compete against these people and there's going to be some new people, but then it's awesome to just make it and then also feel humbled by like the out of state and the international stuff where you're like, oh. So, I mean, there's still such a long road to go, but it's good because then you don't just, I. some people kind of get stuck where they're like, oh yeah, I'm the best in Bellingham, but like zoom out a little bit and like, exactly. you know, <laughs> what does that mean? So. It means you're in Alger and you're at Casey's studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 I would say, um, you know, one of the things that um, the local uh, film community um, suffers from is that people who, some of our, some of our best talent that come up um, leave. They, they go to LA, you know, and they, they go to make it in Hollywood and they go and they get a successful movie written and produced Ryan Covington um, and so on and so forth. And 
and we and and, and we're, we're so very very happy for them i hope that we aren't always the um uh, uh, uh the the nursery i hope that someday um that well, it, I mean, it already has, you know, Casey has an awesome studio. He's sitting in it right now. There mm -hmm. are, things, there are things going on and up here. Um, I, I just hope that people don't feel like that they have to leave in order to become successful. Um, that's, you know, we've opened it up to international films and things, but the, 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 the heart and core of the festival is still, um, the Washington filmmakers. I mean, those are the people who win the thousand dollars, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's always going to be important to us. Yeah, I, I tend to look at it like statewide. You know, I mean, like uh, for instance, me and Connor are working on a project with a, a media team from Seattle, and then I looked up their names and was like, "Wait a minute, they worked on this and bleeding him," you know. And I was like, "This is like, <laughs> the, the state just becomes smaller." And with positive experiences with many filmmakers, that's kind of sets a foundation for further interactions, whether it be uh, bleeding ham based or just uh, in filmmaking in general, you know, or, or, or video content creation in general. So I do like that, you know, while we don't, I, you know, I, I, I'm like 50 50 with Langley. It's like, I like the nursery because then when somebody comes back and they're all super, you know, awesome, or we see them, we're like, hey, remember when you made that shitty film in Bleeding <laughs> <laughs> you know so so uh yeah i don't know I, I mean it's 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 cool it's just um over the past i mean after the first four years of bleeding ham and when we really picked up steam as like a statewide competition mm -hmm. it's given us kind of a breadth of perspective of like of people's views of horror all over the northwest you know and that's that's actually pretty interesting you know because there's definitely the cats in Tacoma are making something different than the cats in Bellingham. You know, the cats in the cats in Spokane are making something different. And it's all, I mean, it's all wonderful stuff, you know, but it's just, it just gives that much more breath to that. So while I really pride it on being Bellingham local and I love the Bellingham film community, I would say that the Bleedingham community has definitely grown to a state level and a somewhat fledgling international level, you know, dare I say, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, from experience, like, I've definitely seen other people's films and then gone up and, like, poached their cameraman <laughs> or, like, you know, uh, linked up with someone from their team or just even given them feedback or, uh, yeah, just, yeah, it's really cool to talk about it and also just get different eyes on your work. Um, like, Gary's talking about the breadth, like, uh you know, you need as many, like, as much feedback as possible to a certain extent, I suppose. But um, just to have it be, like, your story be applicable to a wider group, uh, like, you know, larger audience, so. And as far as the Bellingham thing goes, like, you know, we just need more infrastructure, and luckily Casey is doing his thing and trying to provide that, and uh, there's other people sticking around, so. You know, everyone kind of sticks together that way and you can always kind of reach out to other people to get equipment together and, you know, oh, your actor was really great. Uh, like, what's their number <laughs> um, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I feel like the Bleedingham definitely does. I mean, I think that it helped me um, like really um, push myself to actually start doing film because I think for a lot of people, they're like, you know, it gives them a goal and a deadline of like, I want to make something to submit yeah. to Bleeding Ham. I know a lot of people who made their first um, short films because they wanted to make something for Bleeding Ham. Awesome. <laughs> but um, Casey, a couple of people have been mentioning your studio. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that and how you kind of started that? Uh, yeah, so... I. <laughs> I, you know, I'd been down in Seattle for about five years. You know, we moved, moved out of the area and we're trying to build up the business and the lighting, lighting thing did pretty well. And then, you know, I got married and kind of did a self-evaluation of my life and where I wanted to be. And I always imagined being back in, you know, the Whatcom County area and being closer to Bellingham again. And so, yeah, we, we found a property that was, 
you know, more affordable out in the county with a little bit of acreage and had no whole building on it. So the last year I've just been converting this thing into a, a little micro studio to be able to just do whatever fun, you know, chaos projects uh, we can muster up. And uh, it's been a blast. I mean, I'm just, I'm just kind of getting to a point with it where, you know, things are functional. And so we're, we're actually working on doing uh, a feature comedy and we're going to build a huge set in here and yeah, try it out and see what happens. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. By the way, I'm really, it, is that, is that the project that yeah, I'm yeah. thinking of? Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited for that. <laughs> Me too. Dark Intruder returns. <laughs> <laughs> That's a that's a uh, uh, an in joke. I'm sorry. Uh, so Casey, before you started talking about studio, Raven, something I'd like to share with you that Casey taught all of us. So he's a gr uh, grip and lighting guy. Mm -hmm. That shit is super important for horror. Absolutely. Yeah. So we've learned a lot from Casey in regards to how to control our light. Come on in, buddy how to control our light and uh and when the lack of light is appropriate there's just a bleeding hand filmmaker right there don't worry about mm. color i mean surprise it, guest <laughs> casey brought um different colored lighting to our you know it, uh, he's been huge uh mm -hmm. in the development of, of the films up here and i want to say this about casey casey is game okay for my Trailer Wars entry, Casey was the only person who would sit with his pants down on a toilet and get pulled into the toilet by a giant <laughs> tentacle. <laughs> Casey was there though, and he did it for me. And God bless you, sir. You're welcome. That was pretty good. That was, I, that was very memorable. <laughs> I love that. Yes, I agree on the importance of lighting, but it's also definitely one, I think one of the hardest things to learn when you're just starting out and hardest to get your hands on um, decent equipment to do it. <laughs> well, I mean, when you think about it, you're, it's, it's hard conceptually at first because basically you're painting with air, right? You're, you're, you're painting with nothing. I mean, light is, you know, it, it's color and, and temperature and stuff, but you can't touch it. It's not like, uh, it's not like, oh, Langley make this rubber monster and I can touch it and I can do things with it. it it's, I, I, in my opinion, it, it's kind of conceptual. Would you agree, Casey? Yeah, oh yeah, completely. No, I think you're spot on. <laughs> Yeah, Casey's the expert. Yeah. <laughs> well, is there? I'm sure that y'all have seen a lot of movies over the years doing this festival. Is there anything in particular that stands out to you that you look for that you really love to see in movies that you get for Bleeding Ham? Or is it different every year? Hmm. I mean, I think this brings up something that's important. <clears throat> we are not, uh, or, or at least the organizers of the festival, we are not judges. Mm -hmm. That was the smartest thing we ever did, Raven. Yep. <laughs> um, we seek out people uh, as much as possible who work in either the industry or a storytelling medium. So we use authors, we use established filmmakers, we use um, commentators, people who, who write about horror or write about film. Um, the whole point of the festival is that the filmmakers get better. And the way the filmmakers get better is they get real feedback from people who know what they're talking about. The, the thousand dollars is great. The trophies that I make, that's all fun and great. But for me, if I was entering the festival, the real value would be in, oh, oh my God, the, the, the lady who wrote that book or the guy that, that made that movie is telling me what I can do better. Um, so 
my answer to your question is, I don't think I'm qualified to answer it because I don't judge the movies. I actually like the films that aren't the highest production films and in the top ratings. For instance, I think the movie that Connor was talking about that he didn't want to be turned in, was it The Munchies, Connor? Uh, no, that was, uh, or yeah, The Paranoid one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was great, man. Like, my favorite <laughs> part of that movie is not even horror. It's like, there's a, there's a lady <laughs> sitting on a curb crying with police sirens, and all of a sudden Connor comes out of nowhere with a cat blanket and goes, you're safe now. <laughs> you know, and it's just like, what? Yeah. Like, yeah. It's been like six years since I've seen that, and I still just... <laughs> I still say that to people and throw blankets on them. You're safe. Now. <laughs> There's just like all these great moments from like uh, people's personal uh, outlooks that, that, that show up in film that are super memorable, you know? Um, but if we're going to, I do like monster stuff. So, I mean, I like monster stuff and supernatural stuff. I'm not so much into the psycho killer thing. You know, uh, I feel like there's enough of that in real life too much. And I like to kind of have something so fantastical that it makes me appreciate the mundane of my life, you know? <laughs> uh, not, you know, I don't because you could go watch a movie about a slasher and then go to your car and then be attacked by a slasher. You know what I mean? Like, but you can't go watch a movie about like xenomorphs and then all of a sudden, you know, you're in a ship trying to outrun an alien and shoot it out of an airlock. You know, so something that's fantastical that brings the shared experience of fear is okay with me. You know, I'm not I'm not a fan of films like The House That Jack Built or a Serbian film or any of that edgy bullshit stuff. Um, I just, you know, I just like straight up horror. And I, I grew up, I grew up semi in a religious uh, family on the side of my family. So even though I'm not religious these days, a lot of the religious horror still kind of sticks. So I still get the creeps like, you know, paranormal activity, that, that bumping into the Toby, that thing that's not there. I guess Connor ripped that, the things you can't see, you know, like that, that really does terrify me. So, you know. I'd like to see one where a cat could talk and murders people, though. That would be a good movie, too. <laughs> I like that. I might steal that idea. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I would love to see it. <laughs> well, do y'all have any advice? Because, you know, kind of our, our goal with this is that it's for people who are aspiring to get into a certain creative field. Um, and they're trying to, like, take that first step. So... If y'all had advice for somebody who's maybe been making films and they're thinking about submitting to a film festival but they've never done it before, what would you say to them? <laughs> uh, just go for it. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the main thing is, especially if you are a student and you're surrounded by, well, I mean, I guess times are slightly different now, but you know, if there's other people that are willing to make stuff with you, for free and for the fun, then you just got to use that for as long as you can. Because once people graduate, like schedules are just way more chaotic. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, I would agree with that. don't wait, you know, you, everybody nowadays that has a cell phone has the capability to be able to make a film immediately. You know, it's like if you have an idea and even fully fleshed out and, and you're sitting on it for a while and time is going by, Oh, it's not perfect. You know, you're humming and hunts like just, just make something. You know, like once, <laughs> I think in filmmaking, so much of it is, is once the ball is in motion, that momentum carries. And some people just they they build up that initial step so high, and they think it's so unobtainable. It's it's got to be just perfect. I got to get the right people in this. And it's like, yeah, maybe, or maybe it's just having an idea and getting a couple friends together with your with your phone camera and just making something. And now it's like you you've generated this little bit of energy. And the ball is rolling and it's like it takes so much less to keep that going then you you can build upon that it's like just get out there and have fun and make a film there's there's nothing holding you back at this point everybody has the, the capability that's true it's true it, it you know i used to know people who would spend um a lot of money actually um learning how to make a movie getting ready to make a movie getting all the books and doing uh, it, rather than just making the damn movie. Exactly. And, and they, they, they wouldn't let themselves make a shitty movie or have fun or, you know, it's, you know, they wanted to be Martin Scorsese or, you know, somebody right off the bat and no, just go, just, just go and do it. That's true. My one piece of advice for, for people specifically um, 
entering um, film festivals or Bleedingham in particular, um, less is more, less is more. The, some of the best films um, are some of the shortest films. Don't think that you can't tell a story in one minute because you can. Um, and, and if you do some research, you'll find some good examples of that. Try to whittle, you know, it, it, it's, a block of, it's a block of stone, right? There's a statue living inside that stone. How do you get to it? You cut away all the unessentials. That's how you get to a tight, nice, good film. You strip away the essentials. Don't be afraid to kill your babies. If there's something that didn't work, and even though you might love it, set it aside, keep it as a, a bonus feature or something, but, but be in service to your story. Can I say something? No. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. <laughs> this, this philosophy might not jive with Casey, Connor or Langley. Um, I don't I'm, I'm from the school that there is nothing new under the sun as my grandma used to say you know um, so if you see something that looks dope and you can pull it off with an iPhone like the framing of a shot or the, the, the composition of a shot from a movie that you like jack it it don't matter I mean just jack it and the other thing I'd want to say is if you are making horror please you know pay attention to not just your sound of the recording of the talent but your sound design because a lot of the scare is in the sound. So I've seen some stuff that is visually just, oh my God, that's terrifying. And the mood is set, but like the music is like some vaporwave track and it's like, oh man. And all of a sudden the whole vibe of the movie is like just a edgy music video or something, you know what I mean? But nobody took time to build the sounds around the threat or around what the, the characters are feeling. And that shows, and one of the biggest mistakes that, uh, that filmmakers, or I'd say DIY amateur or, uh, you know, a backpack filmmakers is what I like to call them make, is they put so much into this, I gotta have these lights, I gotta have this, but they don't, they don't put any time into researching a sound bank that's gonna kick ass when they go into the editing session, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I'd say pay a lot of attention to that. Or if you, like uh, Raven, you're in a perfect position up at the college, if you know somebody that's into composing, when I was up at Western, I found a bunch of friends that are into composing, still friends with them now. And uh, man, if you can get a composer for your stuff, oh my gosh. But if you can't, pay attention to ways to build tension, release tension and deliver impact with sound. And there's so many sound libraries and tutorials online that it only take a day of researching to just lock that down or at least tell your composer what you want out of your story, you know, uh, instead of, focusing so much on the shot or, or how this looks and all that kind of stuff, because sound carries a lot of film, man. And yeah, that's all I want to say. So yeah. toward, that, toward that end, I want to say three words. Two of them are together. Room tone. <laughs> Room tone. Yes. <laughs> Important. Okay. The other word is research. Um, if you want to make, and it, it, not just a horror film, but it, if you want to make, you know, if you want to make a comedy, um, you should probably watch some comedies. If you want to make a rom-com, you should probably watch some rom-coms. If you want to make a horror film or you have a specific flavor um, that you're going for, you should probably spend some time. And I don't mean, oh yeah, I watched that movie with my buddies, we were stoned and it was a blast and blah, blah. <laughs> down and pay attention and, you know, why why does John Carpenter's The Thing work so well, you know, as an example, and then sit there and just kind of, and I don't mean like write a college, you know, paper on it, but, but you should do some research, you should watch some stuff um, with a critical mind and analytical mind and say, I, I love this movie, ask yourself why, what, what is it about it that works, and then the answers that you come up with will inform your own work. I, I, I can build upon that a little bit. I think that if you, if you take that principle and you apply it to the fact that so many people lose focus on gear and cool gadgets and 
the hype machine that is ever so rampant these days with film, the new <laughs> drone, et cetera. It's like, look, tools and toys are, are fun, but none of them will save you from a terrible script, terrible acting, bad ideas, poor follow through, lack of script revisions. You know, the, 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 in, my, in my opinion, and this is a person who has a lot of gear, the gear is the last thing I will ever put emphasis on on any project. If, if you don't have something interesting to shoot, it doesn't matter how nice you look at, look at, you know, it looks, it's never going to be interesting, right? So stories are free. You know, you can come up with great ideas all day long and you have the same advantage as someone sitting on, you know, $500,000 of equipment. If they have a bad, bad idea and they go and shoot it beautifully, it's still not good, right? So that's why I said again, it's like, you know, have a great idea, spend time putting something together and then just use whatever you have, you know, and YouTube is a great resource. There are so many videos from you know, millions of filmmakers that, that show you different tutorials on, on how to light with, you know, Home Depot lighting or how to use uh, existing fixtures in a home, put somebody by a window, how to do things out, outdoors. Uh, you know, you have the tools available at your hands now. Just get out there and get it done. Get a great idea and just get started.